All right, hey everyone, and welcome to our video on gut secretions, where we're talking about all of the wonderful little things um, that your gut um, excretes into the lumen um, all the way through the body from your mouth um, to the end of the gastrointestinal tract. So let's get started. Awesome. So the we sort of group it into six main groups. Um, so saliva, um, stomach acid, bile, um, CCK, um, and secretin are all sort of um, a uh, single substance or at least a mixture of substances that is always released together. Um, pancreatic secretions um, are technically always released together as well. Um, they're a little bit more granular. So the other ones are more like this is a, a um, recognizable substance, whereas pancreatic fluid um, can be a little bit more uh, vague. But we're going to treat them as one topic just because um, you don't need to go into that much detail. Um, you just need to know them overall and what's in it, basically. Okay, um, so let's look at saliva first. Um, so in terms of where these are actually made, um, they're made in your three pairs of glands, your parotid, um, which is sort of here, um, your sublingual, which is, as the name suggests, under your, um, your tongue, um, and then your submandibular gland, um, which is down uh, in the area below your jaw. Um, and then we have what we call intrinsic buccal salivary glands, um, which basically just means in your tongue, you also make saliva, uh, which makes a lot of sense because your tongue needs to be pretty well lubricated usually, okay? Um, there are, have been suggestions of a fourth pair of extrinsic salivary glands, but those haven't been um, uh, actually experimentally confirmed yet. Um, so what's actually in these? Usually mostly water, um, like overwhelmingly, like 99 point something percent water. Um, but obviously the water is not the functional component. Um, so although it does help with lubrication a little bit, um, mostly the actual work is gonna be done by salivary amylase, um, which you might know as an enzyme which helps break down um, certain forms of carbohydrates. Um, and it's, it's also sometimes called tylin, um, P-T-Y-A-L-I-N. Doesn't seem like it's uh, particularly useful, but it will become uh, relevant in just a second. Um, ions, so that's like uh, your potassium, calcium, um, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and many of them are useful for your, um, your teeth health, basically. Um, Mucin, which is something you find in most forms of mucus as well, um, and it just sort of adds um, a level of viscosity to it. Um, and then immunoglobulin. So um, it's important to remember that saliva is part of, um, you know, one of those chemical barriers in your immune system. Um, and this is one of the ways in which uh, we can actually try and neutralize pathogens right from the very start. Um, it's a bit like the mucous membranes in your, uh, your respiratory system, really. Um, so it's the same basic concept, and you can see a lot of parallels there. Um, so in terms of what saliva does, there's a lot of actually things it does. Um, so lubrication is one of the really major ones um, because you obviously don't want to dry everything out up there. Um, digestion as well. So again, um, that salivary amylase is, is going to start on digesting a lot of things, which will make it easier for the stomach to finish the job later on um, and the intestines to finish the job later on. Um, speech is sort of a side function of lubrication in that um, it becomes really hard to speak if your vocal cords aren't well lubricated. Um, taste sensation, um, it does also mediate that a little bit. Um, so with each of these substances, I'm gonna separate the triggers where I can into distal and proximal. And by that, I basically mean distal is the thing in the world um, which is like your body is actually reacting to. So this is what's actually happening. Um, and then proximal will be the actual um, signaling uh, molecule usually, or the signaling pathway that triggers it. That's not um, like actual proper jargon. So don't use distal and proximal stimuli um, if you're asked in an exam, um, but just for the sake of, of understanding that there's differences between um, like what triggers it and then how it's actually triggered. Um, and both are actually important if you want, if you want to understand it. So for um, salivation, surprise, surprise, um, if you have food near you or you think of food um, or you feel food in your mouth, um, then that triggers salivation. Um, if you are asleep, um, we, we reduce um, saliva production because you probably don't need it. Um, and when you're uh, afraid, um, you can also reduce it. So if you think a little bit, um, the fear response has a lot to do with your sympathetic drive. Um, and that actually ties into why the proximal um, trigger is the parasympathetic nervous system. You remember sort of rest and digest. Um, so in the parasympathetic nervous system, we want to get ready to digest them. So we secrete saliva. Um, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, so fight or flight response, i.e. fear, um, you don't need to salivate. So you're not digesting anything. You want to use your energy for other things. And so we have less um, salivary uh, secretion, I guess. Okay. Oop. 
there we go. Uh, so we have two conditions with saliva. So you make not enough of it or you make too much. Um, so tyalism, remember how I said um, salivary amylase is called tyalin. Um, so tyalism is having too much saliva. And then xerostomia, which unfortunately doesn't have a good mnemonic, um, is having a dry mouth, basically. Um, so usually um, tyalism is, is more annoying than necessarily a big problem. You, you're not probably going to choke on your saliva unless there's a, 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 sorry, a different defect um, that it's interacting with. Um, xerostomia can be a problem. So um, you can get cavities, you can get gum disease, um, and you can get dysphagia, which we're going to talk about in detail in just a second. Um, so basically, it all comes down to, again, saliva is triggered by the parasympathetic nervous system, um, and we basically can use this parasympathetic nervous system to modulate it. Um, so I should clarify, when I said before um, that the fear response is the sympathetic um, drive decreasing salivary, salivary response, um, what that actually means is suppression of the parasympathetic nervous system. It sounds like a sort of useless distinction, but it is important because physically it's the parasympathetic nervous system which is innovating these things. Um, like there's no sympathetic fiber there that like uh, gets to it and says, okay, stop making saliva. It's more the fact that the parasympathetic system will be depressed. Um, so basically the only lever we have in terms of drugs to actually affect it is increasing or decreasing that parasympathetic input. Um, and so that's exactly what we do. Um, so you might have remember, you might remember um, atropine, which is an anti-muscarinic or a muscarinic receptor antagonist. Um, and so we use that one um, to decrease the production of saliva when we want to. Um, and if we want to increase, um, we use a muscarinic agonist. Um, so atropine is on your core drug list. I don't think pilocarpine is. Um, I think you, you usually get away with just saying a muscarinic agonist. Um, but you get the idea, okay? Um, and also, it's important to remember, xerostomia, it can be sort of idiopathic. Um, we don't know what causes it, but it can also be um, a result of certain drugs you take or um, radiotherapy for like uh, for cancer, basically. Um, so if that's the case, um, then we, when we take away that treatment and pick a different treatment, which is less um, affecting of the, the salivary glands, um, then that can just resolve it straight away. Okay. Um, apologies if I'm going a bit fast. I think I... I should slow down a tiny bit. So um, in terms of swallowing and dysphagia, so swallowing is, well, swallowing. Hopefully you guys are familiar with the concept. Um, dysphagia means you can't swallow, okay? Or you find it difficult to swallow. So there's a spectrum there of like, um, some patients, they can't swallow at all. Um, some patients, they can, or it's painful, or it's um, just hard, basically. Um, either way, it's a bad thing. So in terms of swallowing, you don't need to know most of the, the like fine details here, but you do need to know the broad details. So um, the stages of swallowing. So in the buccal or voluntary um, phase, um, stuff moves from your oral cavity, so just your mouth, um, to your pharynx, which is at the back, sort of the bit of your throat um, that starts at the back of your mouth. Um, and we call that the voluntary phase because technically it is voluntary. So you can, you know, you can stop it if you want to. Um, the, at the same time, you don't need to think about it most of the time. So your brain sort of determines um, or gets used to the uh, the reflex of swallowing. Um, and so it's, while it's not a true reflex, um, you are able to do it subconsciously, okay? Um, and so that comes down to your cerebral cortex. So the fact that it has a really complex mechanism there um, and it's something that you can modulate. You cannot modulate um, the next two phases, which are the pharyngeal and the um, esophageal esophageal um, phases of swallowing because they are like the non-voluntary. Um, so you'll notice um, they do involve um, some level of, uh, of skeletal muscle, um, but their innovation is slightly different. It comes from the medulla, medulla and brainstem, um, which is sort of part of that, that part of your brain. So your cortex um, is generally responsible for all of your voluntary stuff, the stuff you have actually you actually have to think about um, and you can stop doing um, your brainstem stuff like breathing or stuff that's really, really um, sort of fundamental and harder to stop. Um, so again, so like swallowing, um, especially, you know, once it's in the pharyngeal esophageal uh, stage, um, it's just, you know, if you try to stop yourself swallowing, um, you'd have a lot of trouble because it's basically just not regulated by the part of your brain that you can turn on and off. Okay. Um, I get So it's important to know that the vagus nerve um, is relevant there. Um, and so that's, um, controls both uh, stage two and stage three. And so if you have vagal nerve palsy, so something's gone wrong with the vagal nerve, um, then you can have uh, some problems swallowing basically. So that can lead to dysphagia. Yeah. So um, that falls under sort of the neuromuscular um, disorders. So with achalasia, um, that's basically a particular type of, um, of dysphagia. 
Um, you don't need to know too much detail about it, um, but basically it is uh, when a the particular sphincter, um, I believe it's the gastroesophageal, I'll have to check, um, is uh, unable to relax fully. So you've got what we call the myenteric plexus, myo meaning muscle, um, enteric meaning your gut. Um, and so that's basically a bunch of nerves, which if we scroll back, um, uh, oh, I didn't put it here. Um, but basically they're involved in stages two and three, okay? Um, and they're part of that whole sort of nervous innovation. Um, so if they don't work and we don't release the sphincter enough, then basically the esophagus doesn't open up properly. And so you can't pass food, okay? Um, so that is a particular type of wiring defect, which is not, like as far as we currently have, um, we can't fix it, okay? Um, and so what you need to do is you need to put down a balloon, um, in with a little uh, sort of gastroscope or something, um, and you either you know blow it up like that, and that way you dilate the esophagus and, and sort of keep it open, um, or you inject Botox, um, and Botox is just you know um, a paralyzing agent, so um, that will force it to be open. That's not a, a great thing necessarily, um, because obviously sometimes we want to keep those fingers closed when we're not actually swallowing, um, but in that case, you know it's more important that the patient can swallow um, than the fact that you know they have to keep it open basically. Okay, um, so like we said, xerostomy can also cause it. Um, and with mouth, tongue and stuff, we usually want to treat the underlying pathology because there's not much we can do surgically. Um, with uh, what we call out pouching or varices of your um, pharynx or esophagus, basically it just means that there's a little um, sort of divert there. So it's meant to be one road. If there's a little sort of row, sorry, rut off to the side, the stuff can get stuck in there and that makes it really uncomfortable and can make it difficult to swallow. Um, so usually um, in terms of long-term uh, fixing, if it becomes a big enough problem for the patient, you want to go in with surgery and, and basically close it off. Okay. Um, and we can also have it um, secondary to neurodegenerative disorders. So stuff that actually um, messes with your brain. Um, so stroke, um, it might self-resolve if it's a stroke. Um, if it's sort of immediately after the stroke, it might then eventually get better. Um, if it's Parkinson's, then it might generally not get better. Um, and then in that case, you might need to do dilation or a Botox injection. Oh, I said I'm on two pages. Okay. Um, so stomach acid, this is our next major secretion. Um, and so it's pretty straightforward um, in terms of its basic concept um, that the stomach is acidic, everything else is basic. So um, as with the rest of your body, um, most of the gut is actually a little bit basic. Your stomach, on the other hand, is pretty much the only part of your body which is um, forever acidic. So we always want to keep the body, uh, the stomach, at a really, really low pH. Um, the reason for that is twofold. So first of all, uh, actually, it's multiple things, really. Um, so first of all, uh, you want to make sure that the stomach enzymes are activated and working optimally. And if you remember back, um, to maybe bio 3, 4, your bio bridging course, you'll know that enzymes have a certain optimal pH. Um, and so pepsin, which is a major stomach enzyme, um, is going to work better um, at a low pH. And that'll work for other minor stomach enzymes as well. So they're all happiest at a low pH. We want to keep it there. Um, and they also generally, they'll need that to be activated in the first place. Um, obviously, acid, acids do not play well with pathogens, which is good for us because that means we can break a lot of them down. Um, some of them like H. pylori do not break down easily and that can become quite a problem. Um, and it also helps in digestion in the first place. So sort of big stuff like cellulose can be broken down a little bit by acidity. Um, stomach acid is actually pretty simple. It, it's literally um, hydrochloric acid. Um, and the cells that actually secrete it are called parietal cells. Uh, on the next uh, little page, we're gonna have a diagram of the different types of stomach cells. Most of them you don't need to know too much about, um, but it is useful to know that it's parietal cells that are secreting this. Um, so again, um, we're going to talk about distal and proximal triggers. Um, so there are three phases to gastric secretion, okay? Um, so basically, the first one is, um, it's like literally all in your head. So there's not necessarily any food there, um, but you, sorry, any food in your body, but say, you know, you're looking down at your dinner um, and your, your brain is saying, oh, there's food here. Um, so, and so it then stimulates your stomach to actually start secreting HCL. Um, so it wants to prepare that acidic environment for um, digestion, which it reckons is probably gonna come soon, okay? Um, and then the gastric phase, so um, we have what we call stomach distension, which basically means food has got into your stomach, so it's bigger now because it's holding food. Um, and so your stomach has little stretch receptors, which say, oh, we're distended, um, and actually triggers those parietal cells to release stuff. Um, peptides, which are just, you know, um, basically, uh, 
early breakdown of protein, um, which can be done, you know, mechanically or by by sal salivary enzymes. Um, and so uh, that can sort of then increase your HCL production because your stomach says, okay, there's food here, we need to digest it. Um, and a pH rise in the stomach. So that is sort of a bit homeostatic, like we said. Um, we want to keep it a lower pH. If it gets too big, we have to put it down, okay? Um, and then the intestinal phase, this is where we actually taper it off. So the first two phases, we want to increase HCL production. In the intestinal phase, um, the food is basically gone from the stomach. And so we want to produce less HCL or we'll just be wasting it, okay? Um, so duodenal distension, so food, you know, physically pushing into, into the duodenum. Um, protein digestion products, again, same sort of deal, um, or acidity in the duodenum, basically, um, or in the stomach for that matter. Um, so again, homeostatic. So when we talk about proximal stimuli, so what's the actual you know, pathways? Um, so you've got acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nervous system. So those are just going to be synapsing onto your cells um, and actually triggering them to release um, their HCL. Um, we've also got gastrin, which is produced by G cells, another type of um, sec secretory cell in the stomach. Um, and that will again uh, promote production. Um, we then have a type of, um, uh, of so-called, I actually forget the full name. I think it's enterochromaffin cells. Um, Enterochromaffin-like or something like that. Um, but basically they're called ECL cells um, and they're neoparietal cells. Um, and they release histamine, which also increases it. Um, and you'll note that that's also an inflammatory marker. Um, so if you have a lot of histamine because you're inflamed, that can also result in increased um, gastric acid produce, production, okay? Um, and then your somatostatin. So this is also made by certain cells in your stomach, but also um, famously in your hypothalamus. Um, you guys probably haven't learned that because you haven't done endo yet. Um, but yeah, so this is actually primarily has to do with growth hormone. Um, but in the stomach, it also has this purpose of actually reducing um, uh, stomach acid production. Oh, it's not moving. There we go. All right, perfect. So, oh, oh my goodness, sorry, my computer is lagging today. So um, these are basically just all the different cells that we talked about. Um, so your parietal cells, these are the ones that actually do the work. Um, we've got sheaf cells. So that's basically... Um, they make the pepsinogen. Again, so pepsin is a protein digestion enzyme. Um, so they release pepsinogen and then in an acidic environment, that pepsinogen gets converted into pepsin. Okay. Um, D cells, um, they make somatostatin and then your G cells, um, also called enteroendocrine cells sometimes, but usually I think we'll, they'll call them G cells. Um, those are right at the bottom of this, those little glandular sort of structures um, and they release gastrin. Um, yep. Um, so basically, if we zoom in on a parietal cell, you've got um, receptors for those three main types of, uh, of stimulation and then also somatostatin, but that, that decreases production. Um, so technically, technically, um, we can use an anti-muscarinic to block acetylcholine. Um, we can use a um, histamine antagonist to block histamine. Um, but those only block one type, and there are three ways of increasing stomach acid. Um, so none of those is actually going to work so great on its own. It's easier to just um, block them at the end point because there's only one end point for how we actually get um, hydrochloric acid out into the stomach, um, which is our um, hydrogen potassium pump. Um, and so what we want to do, um, or really we usually call it a proton pump, and so we say um, proton pump inhibitors are drugs which act on that pump. Okay, so we use stuff like um, SMFrazole, I think is the main one on your core drug list. Um, and if you actually ask a patient, they'll say they take Nexium because that's the brand name in Australia. Um, and now we can also, uh, yeah, sorry, that the text of that slide is a little bit misleading. I'm going to fix it when I go back through um, because antacids don't inhibit the production. They basically neutralize acid, but it's already there. Um, so ideally, if somebody is like really extreme um, conditions, so, you know, they got really bad um, gastric uh, ulcers or something like that, um, then you might use both of these together. Um, so SMEPRAZOL is actually cutting off the production. Um, antacids cannot cut off the production, but they do neutralize the existing acid. And so they're good in that way. Okay. Um, yeah, so this, this, sorry, just to go back for a second, they sort of complement each other because SMEPRAZOL can stop making new acid, but it can't do anything about the stuff that's already there. Um, and antacids can neutralize the stuff that's already there, but they can't stop it making new acid. Um, so using one on its own will never be as um, 
sort of effective as using both together. All right, so let's talk about bile. Um, I think it's a little bit more intimidating than it actually ought to be because that's pretty simple when it comes down to it. Um, basically, bile is a thing that lets you digest fat uh, because your gut, like most of your body, is a very sort of water-loving environment and fat is not water-loving. So usually um, fat just comes naturally in food as a big globule and it's just impossible to get at any of that fat. Um, so if we didn't have bile, you'd start passing a lot more fat just straight through and you wouldn't actually digest any of it. Um, so what we do is we emulsify it instead. So this basically so says, okay, what if instead of having this big um, sort of big fat thing of fat, um, we split it up into many smaller droplets of fat. Um, now we achieve this using things like bile salts and phospholipids, um, which are able to interact hydrophobically or you know, fat loving um, with the fat molecule, but also hydrophilically with the water around it. Okay, so you'll remember from cell membranes, they have a, they have a, um, a hydrophilic side and a hydrophobic side, and they use that basically to form these little, what we call micelles, um, which are just tiny little fat droplets. And those are a lot easier to digest because um, it comes down to increased surface area. Um, so all of those enzymes, including lipase, which is literally just a fat digesting enzyme that we're going to talk about later, um, they can get at it much more easily um, when it's a micelle, as opposed to a big droplet, they can only act to the very outside. Um, and so it's much lower surface area. So um, bile salts are our main sort of uh, a main active there. Um, they come from cholesterol. So they're cholesterol derivatives, like a, a bunch of other stuff in your body. Um, and so sometimes you'll also get cholesterol in the bile, um, but it doesn't really do anything on its own. Um, so bile salts are the, the actual thing that acts there. Um, lecithin is the phospholipid that we use here. Um, and not much to say about that one. It also acts there. Water, just because, you know, again, we need to make up stuff. Um, in, as in we need to make up a volume and, and make sure it actually, you know, moves. Um, electrolytes, most of these are just sort of, you know, random, again, ions and whatnot, um, but bicarbonate um, does uh, help, uh, so it's, it's very basic, and so it helps neutralize the really acidic chyme, which is just that mixture of stuff from the stomach, um, so stomach acid plus food. Um, so that comes into the, into the duodenum, and that's really acidic, um, which can potentially, uh, you know, be quite bad for the intestines because they're not meant to deal with acidic stuff. And so these help neutralize it. Um, and we've also got bile pigment. So this is, as the name suggests, what gives bile its color. Um, and so they're also made by the breakdown of heme, um, which you get from uh, hemoglobin and myoglobin. Um, and so if you are sort of lacking in hemoglobin um, or you know, there's some other problem with your red blood cells, often um, sort of biliary changes can be a marker of that. And you'll learn about more of that with jaundice. Okay. All right, so um, cholecystokinin and secretin. Um, so these are two more signaling molecules um, and they're basically responsible uh, for the production of, uh, not the production, they're responsible for um, the modulation of um, gallbladder um, and liver release of bile. Um, for CCK, um, and then for secretin, um, they modulate it. So it modulates mainly pancreatic secretion. So they're basically just signaling molecules um, that act on different things that we need to shove into the duodenum. Okay, um, so your cholecystokinin um, it gets triggered by fat um, because its job is to release bile primarily. So it does a bunch of stuff. So um, it also you know, stimulates lipase production, which is a fat digestion, but its main stuff highlighted in orange, in orange there um, basically just comes down to uh, really like opening up all the stuff that dumps bile into the duodenum, okay? Um, so because you, it's fairly easy to remember um, when it comes down to it because um, everything about it is linked to fat. So lipase is the pancreas's contribution to fat digestion. Um, your contraction of your gallbladder um, helps, you know, dump bile in there. Um, it's also named after the gallbladder. So we sometimes call the gallbladder the colossus. Um, and so this, you know, the name almost is, is evocative because it's um, making the colossus gallbladder move. All right, it's making it do stuff. Um, and so that actually uh, helps you release all of that stuff into uh, the duodenum. Um, secretin is more to do with um, pancreatic secretions. And so pancreatic secretions can do a couple of different things, um, but one of the main purposes they have, if I can actually move to the next page maybe, it might be lagging out on me again, hopefully not. 
yeah, it's not cooperating. So hopefully that works in a sec. Um, but basically, so pancreatic secretions um, are what we use to um, a neutralize the um, really acidic substance again. So um, although there's a little bit of, of bicarbonate, yep, there we go. Um, although there's a little bit of bicarbonate in your um, your bile, it's not really enough. Um, so these guys, um, specific, excuse me, specifically the ductal cells in gray there, um, they actually release a lot of bicarbonate, like heaps of bicarbonate, um, and that properly neutralizes the acid. Okay, um, and again, so like with the um, the stomach acid, um, actually keeping a low pH, which will activate stomach enzymes, intestinal enzymes are used to a basic environment, and so raising the pH will help actually activate them. Okay. Um, so your asana cells, they make basically everything else in your pancreatic fluid. Um, so we have proteases. So you remember pepsin breaks down um, proteins a little bit. And then these guys, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, carboxypeptidase, they all break down other parts of proteins. And so they form sort of the full pathway of, of protein digestion. Um, lipase breaks down lipids, i.e. fats. Um, amylase breaks, breaks down carbohydrates. Um, ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease break down um, well, nucleic acids, as the name is suggesting there. Um, so basically, if you think back to your, your four main biomacromolecules, um, this hits all of them. Um, and so this is really, you know, pretty critical um, to your uh, your digestion, okay? Um, little note about the gallbladder, which I forgot to mention earlier. Um, it actually isn't that necessary, I guess. Um, so it only, you, you make about uh, almost two liters of bile a day, like, you know, 1.7, something like that. Um, of that, your gallbladder only stores about 70 milliliters. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, um, not it's not necessary um, on its own. Um, mainly it's your biggest function is to make sure you have a spike of bile secretion right at the time that food is entering your duodenum. And that is actually somewhat useful, um, but it's not essential basically, okay? Um, and so you'll often get people who have an inflamed gallbladder or um, gallstones or something like that, just have the gallbladder removed and that's fine. So they'll survive that. Um, they'll still be able to digest stuff. Um, they might have increased um, trouble with fatty foods because again, they, they cause a really big spike in, um, in lipids and, and related stuff in the moment that it exits the stomach. Um, and we, we can't compensate for that because the gallbladder is no longer there to give you that spike um, of fat digesting enzymes, um, but overall, um, it still averages out to a decent amount. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go too much into the anatomy of that because I believe we've covered it in other videos. Um, so go watch those ones on uh, on gut anatomy, basically. All right. Oh, hopefully it will cooperate with me. Um, I can just start speaking about the next slide before it actually loads in. Um, so basically, yeah, there we go. Um, so trips in. Um, and specifically, basically, the two things we need for this are trypsinogen, which is the precursor, like pepsinogen for pepsin, um, and enterokinase, uh, which is uh, just an enzyme which you find on the membrane um, of mucosal cells. So it's not actually in solution like trypsin is. Um, if you introduce um, trypsinogen in a basic environment to enterokinase, it gets activated into trypsin, and then trypsin activates a bunch of other proteins, basically. Um, sorry, a bunch of other enzymes, which are proteins, but, you know, the, the fact that the proteins isn't important, the fact that they're enzymes are, okay? Um, and so these, it's basically just a, a whole um, activation sequence that only works when things are basic and when you have trypsinogen. Um, so your problems, if you're lacking either of those things, um, because all of that pancreatic fluid will, will just basically be useless um, because you're dumping a bunch of stuff um, which will not actually be activated and not actually do its job, basically. All right, that was a lot of information. Hopefully you guys found it useful um, and we'll see you in the next video.